It's exciting to be in the Lord's house. I mean, we have taken precautions and, you know, we want to do our due diligence, but man, it's just good to be here. Look at people coming in late. Everybody just turn and stare at them. Good to see you. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 this morning. Um, this is Vision Sunday. We have done this every year now for almost 10 years, going all the way back since the warehouse. And uh, we're going to continue to do it moving forward. You've heard me say over the years, you know, if we're alive, there's still opportunity, right? If we're not dead, then we're not done, right? Somebody said on a post that I made, I think it was night before last on Facebook, of our Facebook friends, they said, God has failed. And that really ticked some people off, and they were inboxing me. And I simply replied to this person. I said, God cannot fail. Amen. He can, it's, it's not possible for him to fail. He is God. And people are frustrated in this time. There are some uncertain times. People are angry with God, and, and they say malicious things like that. But the truth is God cannot fail. And I am genuinely excited for this year. I promise you that. 2020 was a hard year. No one's disputing that. I'm not going to get up here and go, uh, Bob, it really wasn't that bad, was it? I mean, come on. We've had worse years. Nope. I'm coming up on 41, and it's been probably the hardest year of my life. Maybe it wasn't for some of you. Some people I know have done really well this year, and it wasn't that hard of a year. But for most people, like 99% of us, it was a hard year. Uh, a scripture came to mind as I was praising the Lord on the way to church today. In Matthew 14, when, when uh, Jesus walks on water to the disciples in the boat, and I was thinking about what it must have sounded like. Now, we have illustrations in the Word of God of the voice of God. Uh, Revelation tells us that when he spoke, it was thunderous. It was like thunder. Old Testament scriptures mirror that sediment as well. And I thought about what was Jesus' voice like as he spoke to them? Because remember, what was going on in that storm? In that time, there was a storm. I just gave you the answer. There was a storm. What happens in a storm? It's loud, right? I had this air machine scrubber up here going earlier, and it was loud, right? You could hear the wind. Imagine being on a boat in the middle of a sea with a storm going on. And when there's storms in our lives, it's very hard to hear God, is it not? It's hard to see Him. The, the Scripture tells us that the waves were boisterous, and so was the wind. And we have a storm going on. Now, I want to be clear. Just because it's 2021 does not mean that the storm has ended. A new year, yeah, I'm all for new beginnings, but just because the date changes doesn't mean our situations do. We often control our circumstances and what's happening around us, and I want to talk to you about the vision for this year today and what our goals are and how we're going to achieve those goals, and then we're going to have a heart-to-heart -heart discussion at the end of it. Now, here in 1 Corinthians 15, if you tuned in last week as we streamed, we talked about this chapter as a whole. We went through and we looked at some scriptures, particularly in the beginning of chapter 15, verses 1 down through 6. And then I summarize, paraphrase for you, uh, 12 on, all the way down up into verses, uh, verse 55 to the end of the chapter. Now, we know that the Apostle Paul here, he's writing to Christians that are in a very uncertain time themselves. Now, as a whole, the world is advancing. Technology is changing the world. Does that sound familiar? I mean, technology has fundamentally changed our, changed our country here in America. Um, this right here has fundamentally changed how we live, how we act, how we respond, how we interact with one another. And we see that as we go back and we look at the last four years particularly. And we see it in censorship. We see how people are afraid of influence through social media and through electronic devices by restricting certain companies and groups from being, being able to partake in them. And this time, technology was changing the world. Um, ships and how they were built, uh, transportation and how people traveled was changing. There was a lot of innovation going on, and so people were able to live in a different way. And with change comes uncertainty. Now, change is hard, isn't it? I, I, most people say, yeah, change is hard. Sometimes it's necessary. It's often necessary doesn't mean that we always like it. Sometimes we do. A new beginning is often a good thing, but we don't view it as such because change is, is something we're not familiar with. So we don't like it because there are uncertainties there. How many of us over the last year 
in 2020 said, oh, I can't wait for things to go back to the way they used to be. I can't wait till COVID gets out of here and we can just get back to how things were. Right? I, I've thought the same thing. There's probably not a day that goes by that I don't think that. I'm going to be as straightforward as I can with you. That is probably never going to happen. I'm not saying COVID is here forever, but what I'm saying is the world is changing. How do I know that? I'm glad you asked, Bob. I know that because Scripture tells me. The Bible tells me that there are certain signs of the times and that sign isn't any one sign in particular, but things that are happening within the world that are changing the world. Now, something happened a little over 2,000 years ago that changed the world. This is the birth and life of Jesus Christ, right? When Jesus draws near, the world changes. When Jesus was here, the world changed, and it's been changed since he, he ascended. But guess what he did right before he ascended? Come on. He promised he'd come back. He, he said, I'm not leaving forever. I'm leaving you with a mission to complete, and when the mission's completed, I will return, and I will gather you unto myself once again. Here are the signs of that, and guess what? The signs are here. That time is drawing near. I wholeheartedly believe that in, in many ways that excites me. Like Jesus is it's soon. Man, it is coming soon. And then in many ways it frightens me. <laughs> Man, am I ready? What is my personal walk like? What is my personal relationship like with God? You know, there is a righteous fear of God and that's okay. Because we, in that we understand who God is and who we are and what our relationship is with him. Here are these New Testament Christians. They have previously planted a church. Paul went and spent over two years with them personally mentoring them and discipling them. And soon as he split, the majority of them strayed from the word and the work of God. It was without any supervision or accountability. They were like, eh, we're not going to stay close to God. Paul hears of this and he writes to him. And in the first six chapters of this book, he lays it out like, I spent two and a half years of my life with you for you to act like this, for you to do the things that you're doing. That is not acceptable and that is not okay. And so he, he writes to them in, in instruction. They go back and forth in letters. And from chapters 10 up until chapter 15, he answers questions and gives them instruction uh, scripturally and in terms of church polity and how to act and operate within the church. But then he gets theological here in chapter 15. And he sets the eyes of the Corinthians on something that all of us as Christians should have our eyes on, and that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, it's not just the miraculous birth of Jesus that is unique. It's not just his life that he lived full of miracles, so many so that John tells us in chapter 21 that not all of the books of the world could contain the miracles that he did. You see, he did more miracles than what are just accounted here in Scripture. Go and even research in your free time the, the historical accounts that aren't held in here that, that notable people in his day and his age wrote about that he completed. Jesus lived a life unlike any other person, but he did something that no one has done under their own power, and that was raised from the dead. Now, there were other resurrections, but they were all by his power. No one raised themselves up out of the grave in the way that Jesus did by their own power. And so he, he speaks here about the resurrection of Christ and then the resurrection of the dead, and he transitions to the end, and he's talking about holding fast to the faith. And a lot of people are scared right now. A lot of people are worried. I mean, we had an unprecedented time and event in, in uh, our nation's history this week, right? That word unprecedented, we're getting used to that. seems like every month something unprecedented happens with what happened at the Capitol and the protests and so forth. And we know a lot of that is manipulated and, uh, and changed through, through mass media and social media and trying to conform what people will think. And so many people are so gullible that they just eat that up without thinking objectively for themselves. You know that Scripture tells us that that was going to happen? Yeah. Tells us that people would believe what they wanted to believe. It said that they would have itching ears, that they would only listen to things that would fit their own personal agenda and their way of life. 2,000 years ago, in detail, it tells us in Thessalonians that that was going to take place, and we see it taking place today. And he's here, he's encouraging the Christians, and he cites a scripture here out of Micah. In verse 55, he says, Death is swallowed up in victory, O death. Where is your victory, O death? Where is your 
sting. David himself said as he approached it, approached death, he said, death, where's your sting? We often view death as a bad thing, right? I'm not saying, hey, it's a great thing and it's something we should look forward to. But we should not fear it in the way that many of us do because we look at that as the end of our story really when it's the beginning. It's the beginning of all eternity. And he's saying, okay, what's the absolute worst thing that could happen to you? Death. But really, where does that compare with the glory that awaits us with the Lord in heaven? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Victory is found in Jesus. God cannot fail. He will not fail. Now, there may be storms raging. There may be things that are uncertain. We may not be able to see very far down the road, but guess what? God promises to get us to our destination. That's a lot easier said than done, isn't it? So many thoughts every day go through our mind. Am I going to make it? What's going to happen? Should I follow this detour? Man, I don't know if I'm going to make it through this afternoon, let alone tomorrow or this week. What if this, this, then this happens and we spend all this time and this energy focusing on the storm instead of on Christ and the path that he's laid before us? So thereafter, he, he lays this prognosis out there of what's the worst that can happen, but then he, he leaves them with a challenge here in verse 15. He says, therefore, knowing all of these things, My beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the Lord, your labor is not in vain. Now, who's he talking to here? He's talking to the brethren. He's talking to Christians. This isn't a sermon that he's preaching for evangelism, right? This is a discipleship moment. He's speaking to mature believers. He's speaking to people that say, that they are Christians, people that say, I have surrendered my life to Christ. I've embraced this gift of salvation, and I've reported it for duty, right? I've gone public with my faith. I am a member of a local New Testament church. This is my church, and I'm going to serve her until the Lord comes back because that's what the Lord's commanded me to do, and I'm going to hold to that. He's saying, well, how do you do that? You do that in three ways, by being steadfast, immovable, and always abounding, Now, what are those three verbs speaking to? They're speaking to the work of the Lord. You know being a Christian is is work? It's hard work? Somebody. (laughs) It is, isn't it? Being a Christian is not easy. If you read any of my posts on Facebook, I have people that I really don't know on there. I'll I'll go, and what I do when I get friend requests is I'll go and I'll, I'll Internet stalk them. Do I have mutual friends? Are they going to try and hack my account? Do we have the same type of belief system? Is this relationship going to be healthy? I I govern all those things before accepting or not. And then there's some people that I haven't talked to since high school. And these people only seem to pop up at times to challenge your way of thinking or things that you say or to try and trigger you in some way. And they're intentionally trying to inflict harm, whether it's emotionally or some other way in your life. Anybody have people like that? Some of them are in our workplaces, right? Some of them are on social media. Some of them are family. I mean, let's be honest, right? People that you're very close with and you don't have a choice but to have a relationship with them. And the last thing you want to do is be Christian. You know, it's like, you know, somebody said to me this week, who's a Christian, they said, my inner Delco almost came out. (laughs) We all know that ain't a good thing, right? Right? I said, I'm going to steal that and use that. My inner Delco almost went out. I almost went Delco on them is what they said to me. And I said, well, I'm glad you didn't. It probably wouldn't have been a good situation. Being a Christian is hard. And it's like, man, these people have said all these terrible things. I won't get to here, but I am going here, right? I won't stoop to their level, but I'll get close, right? The standard isn't other people and how they treat us. The standard is Jesus and how he treated us. And when we deserved eternity in hell and and, and eternal death, what did he do? He came and he forgave everything. Scripture tells us he didn't forgive most or half or some, but all. He died for everyone. He put forgiveness out there. He washed away every single sin if we are willing to embrace that forgiveness. So let's look at the terms here and what they mean. The word steadfast there in the Greek is heterios. And it means, it refers to being seated and settled, firmly settled in place. Now, 
if you ever notice in your Christian walk, when you begin to fall away from God is when you become too busy for God. And I've said this over and over and over again. And one of the terrible things about this pandemic is it literally in our area drove us from congregating here locally. And we follow these mandates and we honor our government and we protect one another by social distancing and, and being wise and running air scrubbers and doing foggers and things of, of that sort. But it also gave people an opportunity and an excuse to stray from God. Now, this week, I, I've personally spoke, or my wife has, or contacted every single person associated with this church, and the bulk of what I get are excuses. Two things. Now, I understand if you have an underlying condition and you need to protect yourself, um, that's a personal conviction. Those of you that are watching at home, I am not criticizing you. That's between you and the Lord, right? I, I have underlying conditions. You guys know I have big time lung issues and that's a personal conviction between me and God. But as Paul says here, you know, death wears your sting. At some point, you have to make a decision. What is my interaction going to be like with God? And he's called us to come together. Now, be wise. I'm not guilt tripping you. If you have an underlying condition, you can't be here. Be wise, but be involved. Just because you have an underlying condition doesn't mean that you stop serving the Lord. Nowhere in Scripture does it say to do that. It says you continue to be faithful in making time for the Lord. Now, there are a lot of people that are part of our church that aren't, don't have an underlying condition but have really good excuses. And, and I joke with some of them and I'll say, you need to change your, your, your job search from what you're doing to being a professional excuse maker. Because you put a lot of time and effort and thought into this. You know, stop making excuses and start being faithful. It, it, the excuses are generally built around, I'm too busy. I'm too busy for God. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine getting to heaven and Jesus looking you in the eye and saying, why didn't you serve me? I gave you salvation. I gave you eternal hope eternal life. I empowered you with the Holy Spirit. I literally gave you divine power at your disposal. And what you're going to tell me is you were too busy. It sounds ludicrous when I say it like that, doesn't it? But so many of us live that way, and I'm guilty of this too. This is a unique time. We have some real challenges here as a church. And, and because of these challenges, I'm forced to do other things. And it makes me even busier than what I already am. I don't know how I do some of the things that I do. And what I realize, if I don't intentionally discipline myself for a time with God, that time don't happen. Mm -hmm. I have to be intentional about it, and I have to discipline myself to it. Now, here, this is written. This term right here gives us an entire broad idea, as Paul is illustrating it. When he's saying being steadfast, you know what he's doing? He's saying, sit down and shut up. Stop making excuses. Stop being busy and meet with God. Focus in on the Lord and your church, specifically, because that's the center of attention as he's writing through here scripturally. Now, the idea of being seated, when you sit down, what are you doing? You're stop being busy. You're being still. You are channeling your focus. See, when we think of steadfast, we often think of pursuing something and pursuance. I'm going to chase this down. No, what God's saying is, I've already chased it down. Sit down and realize what I've done and what your part is within this. We have to make time for God. We can make excuses all the day long. Church, there are going to be things that happen from this day forward, moving forward, that will open so many doors and windows for so many people to make excuses and not serve God. It's going to get a lot easier. And if we are not intentional about being focused on God and his church, churches will die even faster than what they're dying right now. We have to prioritize time with God. That should go without saying. So he, he progresses this thought here from being steadfast to being immovable. Now, in a lot of ways, these two terms are the same. The term immovable there is, is focusing on... Um, Absolute focus, blocking out everything else and focusing in there on the Lord. Now, there's, there's several terms that we get here in the Greek that illustrate that for us, but none more than absolute focus. What he's saying is block out everything else. 
You ever do something and you just have to block everyone out? That's what he's saying here. He's saying sit down, sit still, and focus. Focus on what is right in front of you. Let me ask you this question. You don't have to answer this out loud. What are you focusing on today? What is eating up all of your focus? There's a lot that we could put in that empty blank, isn't there? Right? Finances. I have some real fi- financial hardships right now. Um, relationships. I'm in a relationship that I don't see going anywhere, and I don't know where to go from here, but this is just a very toxic situation, whether it's a, a spouse, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a, a child, uh, an in-law, a parent, right? Some big relational challenges, um, practical issues. I know people, several people that are facing eviction, and there are laws that are protecting people from eviction right now. People at their personal residence cannot be evicted from there. They cannot be foreclosed on. But as soon as that law is lifted, if they don't have all the back rent or back mortgage, guess what happens? So they're living their life understanding that the eviction is going to happen at some point. There are real obstacles in our life, hardships that cause us agony and pain and anxiousness that eat up our focus. And we should take time to focus on those things and try and resolve the problems. But if we are restricting God from every one of those situations, how can we expect to have victory in those areas? You see, Paul premises this entire statement with victory. Victory in God, and then he concludes the statement with victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. How are we to have victory if we push Jesus to the sidelines? I I don't know if any of you watch football, but a lot of the forums last night were blown up saying if Alex Smith had played in that game, they win. Why would you sit the best player, the best quarterback on the sidelines? So many of us do that. We say, I've got this. I'm going to go out and I'm going to handle the ball instead of handing it off to the person that can bring victory to the situation. We need to give Jesus the ball. <laughs> we need to let him participate in what's going on in our lives. And you can say, oh, I do that. I pray. Do you? Do you really pray? Or is that a multitask prayer? Do you sit and do you meet with God? We're going to talk about the strategy for the success and moving forward here in a second. But we need to ask these hard questions first. He says, steadfast, immovable. And what's the last term he uses there? Abounding. Now, the Greek term for abounding here is perizio. I can't believe I got that right. Yes. And this carries the idea of exceeding the requirements and overflowing we're overdoing. Abounding isn't just latching on and saying, I'm here for the ride. It's exceeding the expectations. It's overflowing and overdoing. It's going above and beyond what you are required to do. How many Christians do just enough to belong? Right? We always say here at Rady Church, we're not here to just believe. We're here to belong. We're a big family as a church. That's what we are. And when we stop belonging church, we may still be be believing, but we've stopped being the church. Because Jesus says where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I also. And it's gathered, gathered together. You can believe all the day long, but if you're not belonging, then we have ceased to be the church. We have to come together. We have to congregate. We have to uh, be the hands and feet of Christ in terms of the church. I don't want to just do the bare minimum. That's not my mentality. I want to overflow. I want to exceed. I like to win. I don't know about you guys, but I like to have victory in my life. I don't like losing. I don't know if you you are. You say, well, I'm a born loser. I will pray for you because that is not the mentality of this church. The mentality of this church is to win. It's to exceed. It's to overflow. That is not conditional upon our own power. It's conditional upon the power of Jesus Christ. And we know the type of power that he contains. This world can say and do whatever it wants, but it will never overthrow who Jesus is. Jesus is the king of the universe. Jesus is not held or restricted by social media or websites. If we will faithfully hold fast, steadfastly in an immovable way abounding to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the mission he has called us to through the local New Testament church, we will have victory. It really is that simple. Now let me ask you a very objective question. Everybody here, everybody at home, 
Do you really believe the systematic events that took place through 2020 just happened by happenstance? They just chronologically happened to take place in the order that they did, which very effectively hindered the church of God here in America. I don't believe that. Do you believe that, Heather? You believe that? Eh, just, man, these things just happen to fall together in a perfect way to kill, almost kill, the American church. I got news for you. Churches are struggling. I, I've got hundreds of pastor friends that I've talked to throughout 2020. Churches are hurting. Thousands of pastors I'm connected to through social media um, and different private pages and forums and where they'll lament and will pray for one another and the challenges in which they are facing. I believe church as we know it is, is changing. You know, I have high hopes for different things and moving forward, but we have to come to a place where we understand that things are fundamentally changed. They're not changing. They have already changed. Now, I, I want to read you a quote from Matt Walsh. <clears throat> he tweeted this out this morning. I thought this was really good. This is speaking to, to focus. He says, I was, before, I was born before smartphones, but, can, but still I can't remember what it was like to be in a room full of people where everyone was mentally present and paying attention only to the events and the people around them in that room. That got me thinking. Do you want me to reread that? Yeah. Yeah. He says, I was born before smartphones. Let's just pivot there for a second. That's pretty much all of us in this room except for my kids, Right? My kids don't know what it's like to grow up without smartphones, right? To be that excited when it snowed. Like, I've got something to do, and no school, a snow day, and just the different things. Things have fundamentally changed. He says, but I still can't remember what it was like to be in a room full of people where everyone was mentally present and paying attention only to the events and the people in that room around them in that time. If we're honest, maybe aside from church, Anywhere you go, anything you're doing, you're looking in at a device. Even when we watch movies at my home, I'll take peeks and my kids will be looking at an iPad or their phone or something. I often will do that. I will answer emails as I'm watching football, right? Our attention is continually being attacked and, 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 and we have to mainstream it. Now, I think if we want overflowing results, we have to take overflowing measures. If we want exceeding, if we want to exceed the goal, then we need to change how we do things in our everyday life. Does that mean that we take a fast from our phones? Maybe. It may be that it's how we get up in the morning. How many of you, when you wake up, the first thing you do is pick up your phone? Show of hands. Some of you. <laughs> Lisa, Bob's nudging you. Some of us, I'm that way. Pick it up. Let's just get it over with. I have 20 to 30 text messages every day when I wake up because I turn my phone off at night. Emails that I'll answer, and that helps me to jumpstart the day. You know, years ago, I did this thing where my phone would be in a different room, so when I woke up, the first thing I had to do was focus on the Lord, and I got away from that, okay? I'm being transparent. I want to get back to that. I want the first face I see and the first voice I hear when I get up in the morning to be Jesus. Because of that tone and that image will set the standard for the day. And I encourage you to do the same. Listen, the world will always be chaotic. It will always be busy. It will always have its obstacles. Don't wake up focusing on the world. Wake up focusing on the Word, on the Lord. And we're going to take measures in my home. We're taking measures here as a church this year to streamline our focus on Jesus and nothing else. We're going to do that in three different ways. And you saw it up on the screen as we came up. You're going to see that video a lot. That's by searching, seeking, and serving. Okay, and This is a theme we've had in the past, but we've alter, altered it to kind of fit what we're going through as a church right now. We want to search him through his word. Now, don't answer this out loud, but are you readily, regularly meeting with the Lord? Do you have a Bible plan or a book or a testament that you're reading through this year? I'm going to read through the New Testament in a year. I can't do the Bible in a year. I get hung up. I got hung up on day two for like five days <laughs> because I'll look at a scripture and I'll pull it apart and I'll do translations and then I'll do corresponding scriptures. It's just how I study. It's who I am. It's hard for me, but my goal is to get through the New Testament in a year. Have a 
Bible plan, but have an expectation, okay? Now, if you've ever played a sport or if you've ever competed, do you ever engage in that sport or that game with the hopes that you'll lose? No. You play the game to win, as a coach once said. Have an expectation when you open the Word of God to find the Lord. Open it searching for God and have the expectation that you'll find Him. God doesn't play hide and seek. God's saying, I'm right here. I'm waiting. I am, I, am as, I am here as fast as you can read and as quick as you can understand. Search him out. I promise you, as you search for the Lord in his word, your perception of the world will change. It will change you and how you approach things for the better. You will have more joy and peace in your life than you've ever had before. How do I know that? Because the Prince of Peace told me so. He said that I've come to what? Save the world and to overcome it. And through me, you can do the same. That is a part of our mission. Now, we're going to have accountability with this, and I'll get to that more in a second. But secondly here, seek his will. How many of you can say, I know what God's will is for my life? Don't say to be saved. That's the beginning of your journey. What's the mission he's called you to? To be saved and to serve to serve through discovering his will. If you don't know what God's will is for your life, you'll never really know where you're supposed to serve. You can come to church for years and years and years and say, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. It's because you haven't been seeking his will for your life. Now, if you're a new Christian, that's not, that, that's not something that's new. I'm not saying you get saved and you're like, oh, I know what God wants me to do. I just got done saying the prayer. I'm set to go. This is what I want to do. Sometimes that happens. There are people that get saved and say, do you know what? I think God would have me to serve in this way. Some, for some people, it takes years. When I got saved, it was like a life-changing process for me for a year. I just sought the Lord through his word. That's really all I did. I prioritized my youth group and the word of God, and it was the most important thing to me. I, you know, I got rid of my game system. I had a Sega Genesis. Anybody remember them? Sega Genesis. And I used to play that all the time. And it, I realized that it was distracting me from reading my Bible, so I got rid of it. There was no eBay back then or Craigslist. I, I gave it away to a friend. Why? Because meeting with the Lord was more important. What are you willing to give up and put in place of meeting with the Lord? Meet with Him. Get rid of some of these hindrances. Slow down your life and focus in on the Lord and seek His will for your life. And lastly, serve His work. So we have search his word, seek his will, and serve his work. How are you serving? Um, I, I ask this question to many people as I've, I've spoke to them this week, and I'm going to ask it to you. If you were at home and you're watching the broadcast, and that only, how are you serving the local New Testament church? Because that's what we're here for. God hasn't saved us to sit here or at home. He's saved us to serve. Jesus himself in Philippians 2 gave us the example of serving, right? He took on the example of a servant. So we need to serve. There's so many different ways that you can serve in ways that you're not thinking. When people think of serving, they're thinking of cutting the grass or cleaning the building or, or being a greeter at the door. No, you can be a prayer champion. Pray for certain things every day at a certain time. Say, I'm going to be a part of the Radiant Church prayer team. And I'm going to be a prayer warrior. You can lead a life group or a prayer group. You can be a part of the communications team. There's so many things that we can do. But again, when we cease to congregate and to serve, we cease to be a church. And so I encourage you to do that. And we as a church, we're going to do it in three main ways, two main ways, through prayer groups and through life groups. Now, Russell, if you would do me a favor, can you stop the recording at this time or are you can edit it out later if you weren't? There, I'm going to say some things in here that I can't say that aren't going to be broadcast at public. Bob, would you mind taking it up for us? Pass the plates and uh, we'll, uh, we'll pass them back and then we'll conclude this morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that we come before your heavenly throne. We come, Father, praising you for who you are and how you love us, and how you care for us. And even though we become distracted and busy, Lord, you never leave us. You never stray for us. In fact, you continually pursue us 
Even if we run away, Lord, you are right there. And we are unworthy of that. And I praise you for that, Lord. And there is, we know there is nothing that we are going through today that you haven't already handled. We just need to do it according to your purpose for your glory, Lord. I pray that you'll do just as you have written in your word here, that you will give us victory through Jesus. I give this church to you. I give this offering to you. I, the church's finances in this situation with uh, this virus and, and the government, Lord, I, I give it all over to you, and I pray that you would work through it supernaturally, Lord, that you would provide for this church supernaturally, that you would keep her healthy, Lord, and as we faithfully follow you, that you would honor that, and you would give us the opportunity to bring further glory to your name and point people to you for salvation. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.